Hey, so glad you guys are here this morning. If you have a Bible, open up to the book of Nehemiah. That's, is that me? It's in the Old Testament there. Uh, we've been journeying through the book of Nehemiah, and I just want to say to you this morning, as we've kind of near the middle of Nehemiah, um, just really on behalf of the staff, I didn't really tell them I was going to do this, but I think they'll agree. We have been talking about it. We're just really thankful to you guys for your encouragement and how you've been walking alongside us in this time of transition and encouraging. Um, it, it's just been a really good time for, for us as we've um, just been in the transition. And we want you to say thank you to you guys for just being faithful to be here and to encourage us to walk along. Just lots of comments about how the Word of God is being used in your life, and particularly in Nehemiah. And we've referenced this several times. And we, Kurt and I were even talking about this morning, and Nehemiah was, has been a really difficult book to preach. And um, if, you, if you go online, there's not a lot of people out there preaching Nehemiah, and now we know the reason. It's, it's difficult. Um, so thank you for sticking in there. But the one thing we do know is that all of God's word is true, and God wants to teach us and show us, even in a book like Nehemiah, God wants to teach us. And so... If you have your Bible, open up to Nehemiah again, chapter 6. I'm going to read in verse 15 in just a second. Before we do that, I just want to ask you a few questions to get your mind going this morning. Just some really thought-provoking questions just kind of engage you this morning. Do you, as we've been looking through the book of Nehemiah, we've been seeing this person, Nehemiah, and seeing what God is doing in his life, and we've been talking about building the kingdom and joining God and building the kingdom just, do you personally, sitting there in the pew, hearing us talk about these things week after week, do you really believe that God wants to use you? I'm like, do, do you really believe that, that there's a God who saved you and he saved you for a purpose and he wants to use you for his kingdom? Because I think it's easy as we've been talking about this when we look at Nehemiah and we think about, yeah, that's kind of Old Testament or whatever and we see other people being used by the Lord and we come up with these excuses. I mean, do you really honestly believe that God wants to and can use you to build his kingdom? I want you to be thinking about that question as we work through our text this morning. Nehemiah chapter 6, starting in verse 15, and we're going to go all the way through 773. Not really. We're not going to read all of those names. I'm going to stop at about six, and you can read the names for yourselves later. Chapter six, starting in verse 15. The wall was completed in 52 days. On the 25th day of the month, Elul, when all our enemies heard this, all the surrounding nations were intimidated, and they lost their confidence, for they realized that this task had been accomplished by our God. During those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, since he was a son-in-law of Shechaniah, son of Ara, and his son Jehohanan had married the daughter of Meshalom, son of Berechiah. We should really start thinking about naming our kids like this, because it would make it much easier when we get to these texts to read them, if you've ever pronounced them ever in your life. If we were going to have another one, that's what it would be. Barakiah, Meshulam. Okay, 19. These nobles kept mentioning Tobiah's good deeds to me, and they reported my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. Chapter 7. When the wall had been rebuilt and I had the doors installed, the gatekeepers, singers, and Levites were appointed. Then I put my brother Hanani in charge of Jerusalem, along with Hananiah, commander of the fortress, because he was a faithful man who feared God more than most. I said to them, do not open the gates of Jerusalem until the sun is hot, and let the doors be shut and securely fastened while the guards are on duty. Station the citizens of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts and some at their homes. The city was large and spacious, but there were few people in it, and no houses had been built yet. Then my God had put it into my mind to assemble the nobles, the officials, and the people to be registered by genealogy. I found the genealogical record of those who came back first, and I found the following written in it. These are the people of the province who went up among the captive exiles deported by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. 
Each of them returned to Jerusalem and Judah to his own town. Okay, let's stop there. Like I said, you can read the rest is just the account. It's really a, a basically a repeat from Ezra chapter 2. And um, it's, we'll, we'll get to it a little bit in a second. But it's just the, the accounting of the people of God, of those who, who are in the people of God. So we pick up the story, chapter 6, verse 15, and we read verse 15, the wall is completed in 52 days. And if you've been journeying with us through this journey, you ought to be getting to this point and be close to just like jubilation, right? I mean, we've walked through this journey along with Nehemiah and the people of God, and we've seen all the, uh, the enemies and the attacks that have come. And now here we are in 52 days, the wall is complete, 52 days. I mean, it takes me, it's taken me like three years to redo my bathroom in my house, like 52 days. Now, we're not exactly sure how big the wall is, but even conservative estimates thinking around two miles of a wall and, and maybe 10 to 15 feet thick, maybe even thicker than that, and, and these guys have accomplished that. And for us, we're looking at that, and maybe you're not in a lot of awe this morning. You're thinking, oh, that's cool, they built a wall, 52 days, good for them. Well, clearly, the people in the text, the enemy around them are looking what's happened, and they're thinking, wow, this is incredible. So the feat that they have accomplished, whether we can really grasp it or not, we need to see the text for what it is and see this is an incredible feat. What they have done is miraculous. I think we, we've been journeying through Nehemiah, and often in the Old Testament, particularly in the historical narrative, we get to these texts, or even in the book of Nehemiah, and it's difficult for us. Like, why is this here? Why, why is much of the Old Testament there? Why is there narrative, this historical narrative? Like, it's easy for us to just read and go, okay, another thing, they got the wall built, you know, they do these things. We really hammered on this when we walked through Jonah, and I just really want to kind of go back just briefly here this morning and remind you that all of the Word of God is profitable for teaching, for correction, for reproof, so that you and I are supposed to look at these stories and not just see them as the historical record of the people of God, but we're supposed to learn something about who God is and or how He relates to His people. So we don't, we don't just read through this and just kind of go, all right, they built the wall, let's move on. Okay, we got some enemies here, we got that. Like we, we slow down, we try to figure out, okay, why would the author, what is God doing through the author? Why is he preserving this particular moment in this particular way? So that 200 years after this story was preserved and the people of God were telling the story, they would learn something about who God is. And how he relates to people. So that 2,500 or 3,000 years later, that we would look back on these texts and we would see, what is God trying to show us about who he is? These aren't just neat stories that we read to our kids. Not just clever stories of, you know, we, you know a little guy kills a, a giant. The, the, the world is flooded. You know, these aren't... These are, these are events that happen, yes, but they're also there to teach us something about who God is and how he relates to, his, to people. And I want us this morning to really focus in on three truths from this text that will help us see who God is and how he relates to us. The first thing here that we see in verse 16, or verse 15, the wall is completed. Verse 16, when all our enemies heard this, all the surrounding nations were intimidated and they lost their confidence, for they realized that the task had been accomplished by our God. The first thing that we see, the first principle, and we see this really throughout Nehemiah, but it's, I think it's really kind of raised up right here, is that the power of God causes fear in the enemies of God. When, when God moves in power, when God does something in a supernatural way, now certainly the people of God built the wall. They're the ones who put the bricks on and did the, I've never built a wall, but that's, I'm assuming that's what they did. They, you know, put the bricks and they did all of this. But clearly the people, the enemies around them are seeing this and they're realizing that this had to be accomplished by God. This is something supernatural. Like this is a miracle that they've got this wall built in 52 days. And now these people, the text says they're intimidated and they have lost their confidence. 
God has shown up in a big way and does something really incredible that only God can do. And when God does this, his power is on display so that for those who are against him, they would fear him. They would be intimidated by him. Now, have you ever been in a situation where you've been intimidated and you have lost your confidence? Remember, these guys have been coming at them, right? They've been coming at the people of God, taunting them, telling them they didn't know what they were doing, they can't build this wall, all of these things. And here they are standing in amazement going, oh my goodness, what have we done? It's like poking a bear with a stick, right? It's like we are in trouble. I can remember one of the most intimidating times in my life. I was a junior in high school. I'm sure I've been intimidated since then, but this one really sticks out in my brain and it involves sports. And I tell you guys, that's just where my brain goes. Okay, so I'm a junior in high school playing on the basketball team and we had somehow managed to get into a playoff, a playoff game, a, a first round playoff game uh, with another team in our district because we had tied. And so we're gonna see who was gonna go to the real playoffs. So we're playing Brownwood. You guys know where Brownwood is. I'm from Mineral Wells, America. I love my hometown. So we, um, we're playing Brownwood. We're playing in Stephenville, right? Neutral site, so it's neutral, okay? And um, so we go out. You know, we're in, the, we're in the locker room getting ready. We're getting fired up, you know, getting ready to play and getting excited. We get out on the court first, and we do our laps, and then we kind of, you know, get in our lines to do our layups. And then all of a sudden, I don't know how it happened and how I caught caught my eye, but I looked down to the end of the gym, and these doors swing open, and the smoke starts rising from the ground. This was before everyone had smoke machines. I know everyone does smoke machines now and everything, but it's like smoke starts rising up, and these guys on Brownwood, they look like they were eight feet tall, and they're walking in, and they're walking. They're not running. They're walking, and they're walking in like we own this place, you should be afraid. And I was very afraid. <laughs> I mean, they accomplished in that moment, I was intimidated and I lost all of my confidence. I mean, I was looking at these guys and, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what have I gotten myself into? And they hadn't even done anything, just kind of the way they walked in. But here they are, the enemies of God and they're seeing who God is and what God can do. See, when God uses his people in a powerful way, it's to display his power so that the enemies of God would be intimidated. So they would understand the text really implies here that these guys are intimidated because their gods can't do what the, gods of the, what the God of the Hebrews has done. That, that's what they're thinking. They're thinking, how in the world could this happen? Their God is incredible. Our God couldn't do that. They wouldn't be intimidated if they felt like their gods could accomplish what the Hebrew gods have done. They wouldn't be intimidated. They would look and go, oh, that's pretty impressive, but we can, you know, we can do this or that. They wouldn't be intimidated. And they're looking at the power of God, and the power of God on display is supposed to intimidate them, to help them lose their confidence in themselves, ultimately to see that the power of God can save them, that there is no one like God. There is no one like the one true God who has the ultimate power. And the enemies of God, the people who are against God, the people who do not see God for who he is, that they would see God as the ultimate one with the ultimate power. And you think about, for us, again, we, we look through the Old Testament through the lens of, of the cross and the gospel, and we've never seen the display of the power of God like we've seen in the person of Jesus Christ. Right? Jesus comes and he lives on this earth, and through the power of God, he never once, not one time, gives in to the strong temptations of the enemy. Never once does he sin. And then he goes to the cross, and they put him on the cross, and he takes the sin of the world on himself to be a substitute for our sin, to take the punishment for our sin, miraculous he would be the ultimate sacrifice to take the punishment for the sins of the world and then they would put him in the grave but the grave couldn't hold him had the power to overcome not only sin but to overcome death 
And he rose on the third day and he never died again. He ascended to the Father and he sits at the right hand of the Father waiting to come back. So there's no one who's ever displayed the power that's been displayed by God through Jesus Christ. And if you can remember what it was like before you came to know Christ, or if you're in this room this morning and you're still fleshing that out and not really sure if you want to trust in Jesus this morning, I want you to see the power and the majesty of God in what he does through his son, Jesus Christ, to make him a substitute for your sin and conquer sin and death for you. There has never been a display of power like that ever in the history of anything. Your God is powerful. He can overcome sin he can overcome death, two of the most, the most difficult things that we have to deal with in this life. And Jesus has victory over those things. You remember what it was like maybe before you followed Christ and you understood the power of Jesus Christ that he came to save you. I hope in, on some level you were intimidated and you were like, wow, what an incredible God. And that intimidation is supposed to move us to a place where we say, wow, I want that God to be my God. I lose my confidence in myself and I place my confidence in Jesus Christ. It moves us into the second point really clearly here, starting in verse 17. During those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him since he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, son of Era, and his son Jehonan and Mary, the daughter of Meshalom, son of Berechiah. These nobles kept mentioning Tobiah's good deeds to me, and they reported my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to me. So he, he starts there in verse 17, during those days. And it's really kind of unclear. Is he talking about why they're building the wall or here after they're building the wall? And so I, you think, why is this here? Like, why didn't we just go to the wall's been built, and why, and, and when I, and just start right into chapter 7, verse 1, and we rebuilt the wall, and this is what we did. I think. The author is putting this here so that you and I will remember that the enemies have been coming after Nehemiah and the people of God and how Nehemiah and the people of God has, have responded through the power of God. He's juxtaposing these verses here like, the wall is finished. The wall has been completed. Oh yeah, don't forget, there was all of this opposition and all of this thing that was going on to keep the wall from being built. Here on one hand, the wall is built, be afraid. Here on the other hand are Nehemiah and the people of God who have the freedom to follow God because of his power. If the power of God causes his enemies to fear and the power of God causes his people to have complete freedom and confidence in who God is. Over, and this isn't new, over and over, Nehemiah and the people of God have been attacked spiritually, physically to try to keep them from doing what they're doing. And Nehemiah just kind of matter-of-factly walks through this, right? Oh, yeah, we built the wall. Oh, yeah, there was this guy. He was coming against me. No big deal. We moved on. Like, the people of God understand that they have the complete freedom to do and be what God has called them to be because of the power of God in them, what God is doing through them. I mean, Nehemiah, over and over, if you've been walking through this over and over, he stops to say, God put this in my heart, or God did this, or he prays for, for God to do something. And over and over, God continues to, do, to, to work through Nehemiah. Nehemiah completely understands that he does not have the power to accomplish this task. All he is doing is being faithful to what God has called him to do, and he can live this out in complete freedom to be who God has called him to be because he believes in the power of God to accomplish the things of God. So you and I have the, com the complete freedom as followers of God to believe in this incredible power that we've been given in Jesus Christ. We remember, we've talked about it several times, Matthew 28 and the Great Commission. Jesus tells his disciples, all authority has been given to me, so you go make disciples of all nations. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to be with you. And we know he sends the Spirit to live inside of us, to indwell us when we uh, decide that we're going to follow Jesus, and now we have the power of God living in us. So this is where the sovereignty of God and man's responsibility just collide. 
Right? God is saying to Nehemiah and the people of God, hey, I want you to do this. And they just say, okay, if this is what you want us to do, we're going to start building. I don't know if they ever really had it in their mind that they were going to do 52 days. Maybe Nehemiah did. Maybe he's a great planner. Maybe he knew exactly what was going to happen. I think they were just being faithful to what God had called them to be. And they get to day 52 and they look up and they go, wow, look what God has done. Their confidence And their freedom was in the power of God, not in themselves. I think so often we forget about the power of God. We're a lot like Moses, right? God calls Moses to lead his people out, and he starts making excuses of why God can't use him. I think we do that a lot. God says, hey, I want you to share with this person. I want you to lead your family. I want you to... Whatever, this big thing God might be calling you to, and it's easy for us to just say, God, I think you've got the wrong person. I don't have the skill set. I don't have the ability. And God's saying, yes, you're exactly right. But I do. I have more power and more authority than you can even imagine, and I will work through you. He helps us see this in verse 7 when he talks about rebuilding the wall, and he appoints the gatekeepers, singers, and Levites, and then he has Hanani and Hananiah, and he describes Hananiah as the commander of the fortress because he was a faithful man who feared God more than most. So I think Nehemiah wants us to see here, the author wants us to see here that the power of God brings fear to his enemies. The power of God brings freedom to his followers, but the power of God is ultimately on display through his people. He just wants us to be like Hanani, faithful, not perfect, but faithful and fearing God, knowing who God is, knowing that he is the all-powerful one. That's what it means to be fearful in, in a righteous and holy way. Not in, not an intimidated way, but in a way that says, yes, this is a God who deserves my awe and my respect and everything from me. And I trust him. I will be faithful to him. I will fear him. Whatever he asks me to do, I will do it. See, the building of the wall, we've talked about this. The building of the wall has never been about the wall. When God does something all throughout scripture, it's always about the people. Now, certainly, it's for God's glory, but God is always using people. Now, sometimes he uses donkeys. Sometimes he uses, you know, other circumstances. But over and over and over again, God uses normal people just like you and me. And we look at these guys and we think, oh, these must be the super godly people. They're not. They're people who just said, I want to be faithful to you and I want to obey you and I fear you because you are the one true God. God is saying to us this morning, he wants to use us. He wants to do incredible things through us. So that's the reason that Nehemiah does this genealogy and tries to figure out who all the people are, who are the people of God, and who are the people who are pretending to be the people of God. And he starts into this, and when we get to chapter 11, is really kind of when we have the big party for the wall. Nehemiah understands that what he must do now is not just build this cool wall, but now the people of God must come inhabit the city and live like the people of God are supposed to be living. It's always been about the people. And over and over in the scriptures, God chooses to use people to display his glory, to display his might. People who can't, people who don't have the skills, people who aren't good enough. So that when people will see the work of man, they will see really the power of God. Certainly, Jamie helped us understand this last week. There are things in our lives, day in and day out, that we are relying. We're saying, God, I want to be faithful in this, and we're trusting that God will do something in display of his power. Let's just think about our children and raising our children, because Jamie mentioned that last week. If you have kids, and we say, yes, God, I want to be faithful. I fear you as the one true God. I want to pour myself into my kids. I want to train them up in godliness and righteousness, but that will not be enough. The Bible tells us that that's a good, a good place to be and that's a good start and that's very helpful for our children, but it will not guarantee that our children will place their faith in Christ. God must do a supernatural work in their lives to bring them to faith. You have neighbors, you have coworkers. God is just asking you to be faithful 
See, we need to change the scorecard. God has not asked you to save anyone. I think when we start talking about evangelism and sharing the gospel, we'll get really fearful and really scared. Like, what if they don't trust in the Lord? What if they don't understand who Jesus Christ is or whatever? It's like, that's, that's not who God is, what God has asked you to do. God has just asked you to be a messenger, to share the good news of Jesus. He hasn't asked you to save anyone. The scorecard, the win is me being faithful, me being obedient, saying, God, I fear you. You've asked me to do this, therefore I will do it. I don't think I have all the right answers. I have all of these problems. I stutter or whatever it is. God just says, I just want you to be faithful. And you let me do the supernatural. Now, now to be sure, before we jump in here and talking about, are we really trusting God to do something incredible? I think there's this part right in here where he talks about what he tells them to do with the gates. He says, hey, don't open them really early in the morning. Let's wait a little bit. Open, open them when it's kind of hot and let's close them a little early. What he's saying is let's be smart here. All right, let's, let's make sure we're not just doing something stupid. All right, let's, let's, yes, sometimes God calls us to, to do things that we don't understand, but in the same token, like we, need, we need to use a brain that God has, had, God has given us. He's saying, listen, if you open the gates too early, the enemies are going to come and rush in while we're all sleeping. We're not going to be able to defend ourselves. If we wait too late, right at that night, they're going to do the same thing. Let's kind of open them. And he puts guards and he puts people out there. He says, yeah, we're going to, we've got to protect the city. Right? We can't just kind of go off in La La Land and do whatever we want. God is still asking us to do things to be faithful and, and to, to live according to what he wants us to do for our protection. But there is no doubt as Nehemiah is an example, and over and over in the scriptures, God asks people to do things that are beyond them. Is there anything in your life that you've ever trusted God with that you knew could only be accomplished through him? I mean, do you believe that God wants to use you to do incredible things for his glory, for his fame? Or are you just kind of stuck in cruise neutral Christianity. I just, let me just keep it right here and right here, you know. I'm safe right here, right? It's like a hitch, right? You guys seen hitch? Like when he teaches them how to dance, right? He's like, just keep it right here. You're safe right here. Don't, you know, don't get out here. That's, that's craziness, right? <laughs> just keep it right here. I think we live our Christianity like that. It's kind of, God, I, I like this safe spot. I can handle this. I can deal with this. Are you listening for the voice of God that would tell you, step out and do something that you don't think you can do and watch the power, watch my power be on display for my glory? The world doesn't take notice of Christians who do everything on their own power and their own accord and everything. That doesn't mean, they, they, they've got the same resources, they've got the same money, they've got the same talents. The people of God will take notice when, or the people of the world will take notice when they see the people of God stepping out in faith and doing things and say, I don't know how God is going to accomplish this, but I know God has asked me to do this. Again, not saying you're just going to do something to put God to the test. Listening for the voice of God that says, yes, I want you to do this. Sometimes it's as simple as sharing the gospel. Sometimes it's as simple as being faithful to your kids and raising them up. Maybe it's something even greater. Maybe it's giving more than your 10%. God's asking you to just sacrifice more. Maybe God is asking you to do something you know, crazy like adopt someone or foster kids or something that for most people would be, oh, wow, that's really crazy. And you're like, yeah, I don't know how we're going to do it. We've already got you know, enough kids. I'm not sure how we're going to do another one. Maybe God is calling you to move your life overseas to be a missionary. Or maybe God is calling you just to move in Abilene to a different neighborhood to be a light in a difficult neighborhood. Whatever it is for you that God might be asking, are you at least listening for the voice of God in your life that God might be asking you to do something that only he can get credit for? I want to remind you two summers ago when we when we took the trip to Thailand, I can remember sitting in Kevin's office with the staff and Kevin's like, hey, I've got this opportunity to go to Thailand, but they want us to bring 40 people. And we kind of all looked at each other and we're like, okay, 40 people at, you know, 3,000 or whatever it was a piece. Like that's a lot for a church our size and for people you know, like we, we have people with jobs and this is, you know, to take a group of five or six 
is, is an undertaking of itself, but to take 40 for a church of our size, and we're, I remember sitting there thinking, God, if we do this, you're going to have to accomplish this. Well, we can't do this on our own. And I remember telling Kevin and saying, we've got to do this. God is asking us to do this, and we need to step out on faith and believe that God is powerful, and he can meet all of our needs. And if he's calling to us to this, he will accomplish the task that he's called us to. And I remember watching as I was a part of kind of planning that and seeing the people. We, we weren't even sure if 40 people would sign up, and we got almost exactly 40 somewhere around there, and people signed up. We're like, yes, we want to go, we want to go, but we're not sure. And individually, people were going, God's going to have to do something. God's going to have to show up because I don't have the money, and I don't understand how this is going to happen. And then we get to the day when everyone's leaving, and I remember coming up here and watching them load the bus and thinking, how amazing is our God? Are you listening for the voice of God? That maybe, just maybe, he might be asking you to do something that just seems radical. Seems like crazy Christian, right? Because he wants his glory to be, he wants his power to be on display for the world to see. One last text. Flip over to 2 Timothy. I want us to see one last text here about the power of God in us. 2 Timothy chapter one. Starting in verse six. Therefore, I remind you to keep ablaze the gift of God that is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fearfulness, but one of power and love and sound judgment. So don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Instead, share in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. When you wake up in the morning, do you just think before your day even starts, God, I need your power today or I will not make it to the end in a way that will display honor and glory to your name. And all of my relationships and all the opportunities that I might have to share the gospel with my family, with my friends, all of these things. God, I am depending on your power to live for your glory and for your name. Do you realize the power of God lives in you to accomplish the supernatural? Whether that's bringing people from death to life or whether that's doing something, you know, crazy radical. And God has not given you Spirit of fear, one of power and love and sound judgment, but one of power. God wants to use you. Stop making excuses and believe in the power of your God to do incredible things through you. I mean, do we really think that here in Abilene, Texas, South 7th and Palm, gathered people here, that God really wants to use us in this city? Do, do we really believe that God has the power to use us in this city? You know what it will take? It will take us being faithful, saying, God, we love you, we honor you, we cherish you, and we're going to be faithful, and we're going to do what you've asked us to do, and we'll leave the rest up to you. But God, we are here, and we are ready, and we want you to use us for your glory and for your name. God, would you do something through us that would give you incredible glory, that people would see the power of who you are. Not getting before God, not demanding that God would do something, just saying, God, here we are. That's what Nehemiah was at the beginning, right? Here's this news, he hears that the wall needs to be built, and he prays, and he says, God, is this, do we need to do this? He's just being faithful, following the Lord, listening to the voice of God in his life. God says, yes, I want you to do this. If each of us in this place would say, God, I just want to be faithful and I want to be obedient to you because you are the powerful God. You are the one true God who has all power and all authority. And maybe God would look at us and say, yes, I want to accomplish incredible things. I want to see people in the baptism week after week, lives being rescued, lives being changed. 
And whatever he wants to do through us in this city, that we would say, God, we believe in your power. We believe that you are a God that can do incredible things. And we're going to be faithful. And we're going to be obedient. And we're going to love you. Would you use us for your kingdom, for your glory?